So, without further ado, our new physiotherapist, aspergillosis expert, <laughs> yes. Philip Language, will give us a talk about the kind of things he's going to do with the patients in the clinic. Let's talk for a second. For five minutes. It's a two hours, so <laughs> brace yourself. Over to Philip. Thank you, thanks for that. Okay. Um, as, as Jeremy said, my name's Philip Language, and I bring technology that doesn't seem to be living. Um, and I've been recently appointed to be a specialist physio within the aspergillosis service. Um, and I've been asked to talk to you today, and I asked, well, what am I supposed to talk about? And um, I was given a list of, uh, of things that you'd be interested to know about. Um, and I'm going to have to walk over here. There we go. Should I just sit here? Is that alright? Okay. That's messing for me as well. Because I just shake in front of you. So I know who I am, but I don't know each of you individually. And everyone here has got a range of different abilities. So it's very difficult to say something that's appropriate to you as individuals. But um, what I thought I'd do is talk about exercise. Um, and give you some ideas about what you, you might be able to do exercise wise. Um, I've been asked to also talk about the active cycle breathing technique, which is something to do with helping you clear your chest of secretions. Um, but I'm going to mainly focus on exercise. Um, because there are various dimensions to exercise, and it's quite a quite a threatening word, as you can see by the turnout today. Um, so I assure you I'm not going to get you all doing a group exercise session, I promise that. It's not just you. There are a few texts that people aren't writing on the That's not just you. That's okay. That's okay. encouraging to know. So I thought I'd focus, firstly, with optimising general well-being through exercise. Because I think that was the, the way it was phrased to me, that's what you wanted to know about. Um, now, when you talk about physical fitness, um, you can talk about health fitness, uh, which is lots of different dimensions to it. So, body composition, so that's how much fat and how much muscle we have, really. Um, there's cardiorespiratory endurance, um, how flexible you are, uh, and muscle endurance and muscle strength. Um, endurance is a, a bit of a strange word, and that... Um, when I hear the word endurance, I think of the word slog. Um, but endurance is being able to sustain an activity, and strength is how, how forceful, really, or how powerful um, you can contract a muscle. Um, now, some people talk about performance or skill related fitness, um, and that's more to do with a task or an activity, a particular sport. Um, and that has slightly different connotations things like agility, balance, coordination. Uh, power, reaction time, and speed. Now, most of what I do is to do with health fitness. Um, I don't go up to Doyle and Wilson Ward and do reaction times and train people up for that. Did you do those? Or? Um, I, I, I can do everything there, but what I tend to... Do about the splits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's me on a Saturday, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I thought it might be interesting to sort of put a statement out there and see what you thought about it. So most people here will have lung function tests done. So you have a machine and you blow out hard and, and as long as you can. And then some people think that the worse your lung function tests go, the less you're able to do. Um, and I don't know if you think that's true or false. Uh, I'm not going to put anyone in the spot, don't worry. But it's not necessarily true. Hello! Hello! Hello. We will Hello. find you. Thank you.
and they're recognising the importance of doing a little bit of weight training as well. So some physios will say, on one day do a bit of aerobic type stuff, so you know, walking, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the next day do a bit of weight training, the next day do a bit of aerobic. No one's really sure what's best for absolutely everyone, because we're all so different. But uh, I think it's important that you make uh, exercise part of your weekly routine. But more on that later. Uh, if you exercise more, you live longer. And generally speaking, it's true that more active people tend to live a little bit longer. But um, on the other hand, there are people who exercise too vigorously without any training beforehand, and they're the people who are more likely to have acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. Um, it's a small risk, but uh, uh, if you do nothing and then decide to do the London Marathon, don't be surprised if you get in trouble. Yeah, it's um, usually, what about the gentleman that wrote all the books on jogging and dropped dead while jogging? While jogging, I know. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. His dad died when he was 14. He died when he was 56. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, this is the gentleman that was jogging. Jim Dean. Yeah. 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 A lot of the time we talk about chances and relative risks. Yeah. It's, it's like smoking. We can all point to people who smoke, who have lived in today, who are 90, who are quite happy and do really well. But we know that if you exercise more, you have a chance of being you have a better chance of living. That's certainly true. Um, do we think that people who exercise are healthier? Yeah, generally speaking. I think that's generally true. I think there's some people who go down the gym four hours a day, five hours a day, and make it an obsessive compulsion. Well, I'm not sure that's particularly healthy, but I think generally speaking that's true. Oh, this is an interesting one. Exercise is necessary for weight loss. I've done that. <laughs> You've done that. <laughs> well, what we, what we tend to think now, and um, work done over in America, actually, I think it's Penn State University, um, it's difficult to just say, uh, to isolate exercise as a thing uh, that people do and um, related to weight loss, but they manage to do it. Um, unless you exercise quite vigorously, um, it doesn't really contribute to weight loss. The, the big thing for weight loss is um, dietary intake. That's the biggest thing. So all the people who indulge at Christmas and join the gym without changing their diet are usually sadly disappointed for that week. Yeah. I thought that was quite interesting. That's what I'm <laughs> I'm a physiotherapist, and when I talk about exercise to people, a lot of people sort of ask me about the gym, thinking that that's what I'd recommend for everyone. Um, I'm not sure the gym is the best place to exercise. Um, I've been to a gym uh, as a paying member of the public twice with my wife to keep her company. Um, I hated it. I absolutely hate the gym. It's not for me at all. Some people love it, and some people like the control environment. And um, for some people, it's, it's a thing that they can make part of their routine and they enjoy going, and that's great because that's sustainable. Um, but for me, like I said, I went twice, and I said, uh, you go yourself next time. Uh, it wasn't for me. Uh, I do something else. I play hockey, I enjoy that. Um, and I do a little bit of cycling. Uh, and that fits in with my weekly routine. Um, but if you enjoy the gym, that's great, but it's not necessarily the best place to go.
Not really, no, you don't. Um, some people think that they have to invest in a treadmill or an exercise bike or pedals or weights uh, or flash trainers or second skin like I'm really glad I don't like that. Um, no, you don't need special equipment to exercise at all. Um, you must warm up and cool down every time you exercise. Have people heard of warming up and cooling down or warming down? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's important? Yeah. 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 Why do you think it's important? Yeah, it, it, it's called warm up because it, it warms your body up and it keeps your muscles warm so they're more stretchy so they're less likely to, to be damaged when you exercise. Um, it's probably a good idea to slowly increase your heart rate as you exercise rather than go from being sat still to flat on sprinting. Um, and cooling down as well, that's quite helpful for reducing muscular ache after exercise. So if you're the sort of person who goes for a long walk and then aches that evening or the following day, having a few stretches afterwards um, can make a real difference to the pain you experience after exercise. That's what cooling down is for. You are the less fit you become. Mm. Yeah. I think that's true. This is what people are doing. Yeah, it's a lot of money. I was telling you, I'm advertising something. I've been singing out of the van. And it looks really good. I feel it's there. What's his guns in the rods or something? Is he? I
to doing vigorous exercise that's dangerous, particularly for people with heart disease. That's that's why that's the particular danger group. Um, but no, if you've got uh, a bit of blood, high blood pressure, don't worry, exercise is pretty good for you. And uh, that certainly isn't true. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's certainly not true. It's certainly not true. Um, oh, you let me know. <laughs> I saw you draw a passport, Crumbs. <laughs> you and Georgina, I mean, we've raised the bar. Okay. Um, I was giving you the point. I did the 10k, it's fine. I've got that down, but you've got something. I was pushing myself ahead. I was pushing myself ahead. So, the form of sort of reading and experience, this is what I believe. I believe that exercise can help people cope with everyday life a whole lot better. And I don't just mean physically, because um, everyone tends to focus about the physical side of exercise, but there are non-physical benefits as well. Um, it can reduce the risk of lots of health problems, I think there are about 20 listed. Um, but the big ones for me are stroke deep vein thrombosis, heart disease, osteoporosis, depression, um, as well as being isolated socially. Um, there are lots of things that get in the way of people exercising. Uh, I can think instantly of 20 reasons why I shouldn't go for a walk this up when I get home from work. And I, can think, I can put many, many things in the way of me doing exercise, and I think that's normal human behaviour, but uh, it's important to uh, understand what what those barriers are and why they're there and maybe how we overcome them. Because that's we can talk about as a group, but you have to think about it as an individual as well. And everyone in this room can do exercise that will benefit them. Or anyone listening to this if it's been recorded can do exercise that will benefit them. There's no one that exercise will not help. Now being specific with lung disease got to think, well, why is my exercise limited? And there are a host of reasons. And I've tried to break it down into parts of your body. So let's talk about sort of your mind first. So anxiety and, and depression are big reasons why people don't do very much exercise. Um, um, anyone done a HAD score? No? Do you use them at all? No. No. Okay. But sometimes we... Alright, sometimes we look at how people are feeling, but exercise, they get in the way of doing exercise. Some people's control of breathing and how breathless they feel and when they do exercise is slightly abnormal. So people feel, that feel overly breathless um, for a given bit of exercise. And that can limit you. So how you feel, how breathless you feel. How your lungs actually work. Okay, so the structural changes perhaps in your lung as a result of the lung disease you have. And that can change how well they work. Um, both in terms of how floppy they are, or how stretchy they are, how stiff they are, uh, as well as the fact that they, it might vary in how well you, are, you can get oxygen into your body and get carbon dioxide out of your body. And that can limit your exercise. Um, how well your heart and your blood vessels work. Um, your nutritional status. Lots of people with lung disease don't eat very well. They tend to have, um, they might have two meals a day, and one of those meals is a sandwich. The other, other meals are bowl of cornflakes. That's quite common, actually. Um, or they find it difficult to get to the shops or to carry the shopping, so they don't carry as much or buy as much. Um, and that has an impact on how, how much fuel you're actually taking on board. Um, and talk about muscles, um, not only your arms and your legs, but your breathing muscles can get tired. And that can, particularly if you're having to work against the bigger resistance, so that can limit how, uh, how much exercise you can do. Um, and if you don't do very much and you're inactive, you get something happens called deconditioning, so you actually get muscle wastage. Uh, another way of saying that is disuse atrophy. So if you don't use it, you lose it. And that, that happens quite often when people come to hospital. You come to hospital and the food's brought to you, and you, don't, you don't have to go very far, and you feel rubbish, and you think, oh, I won't. And then before you know it, 
and then your weekend, you go home, and your family are really nice to you, yeah? and they look after you, perhaps, and then you don't have to do as much at home. And because of all that, you lose muscle strength. No, it's, you lose it a lot quicker than you get it back. And that's worth bearing in mind. Um, so, <coughs> this conversation with the patient on the ward, just before we came to the meeting, weren't that? She was like, she wants to keep going, but she went to the trying to get her meal. You know, oh, you are, you go, you go and lie down, we'll be giving you dinner, but she wants to keep moving. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting how so, we, we almost encourage this along sometimes in hospital. So, yeah. what, this, the, the reason why lots of people hide from me on the hospital ward is I try and make them do things that they don't feel like doing, but it's with trying to prevent these kind of problems a lot of the time. Now, what does exercise do to your actual lung tissue? Not very much at all, <laughs> unfortunately. So you're not going to reverse a disease process through exercise. You might change the muscles around it, but um, you won't make your, muscle, your lungs stiffer or floppier through exercise alone, unfortunately. So, there might be other reasons why you don't want to exercise, other than it's not doing anything to your lung tissue. Uh, exercise can be unpleasant, so you get shorter breath, which most people don't enjoy. Uh, uh, some, sometimes they do. Uh, you might feel tired, you might get some pain when you exercise. So the arthritis going back, your knees might ache a bit from your hips. Um, you might be embarrassed, so getting shorter breath in front of people. Yeah, or sweating, absolutely. You might think it's dangerous for you to exercise. And that might be because you've got poor balance, for example. Yeah, so you might run the risk of falling over. So you think, well, better stay in the chair. Um, and you think, well, I can get through my day without exercising, so therefore it's unnecessary, so I won't do it. I think that's the big reason maybe, for a lot of people. And it's difficult to see that it's a necessary thing to do. Um, and it's inconvenient. You have to, there's 30 minutes a day. Well, I struggle to get... <laughs> get through my day alive, really. <laughs> um, I'm sometimes I'm that busy. So, um, trying to make 30 minutes can, can be a big ask. So there are lots of reasons why people don't exercise. So, so what, how can I sell it to you that it's worth doing and spending 30 minutes five times a week or doing some summer exercise regularly? I think in simple terms, if you exercise, you can use what you've got a lot better. You can improve how you use what you've got. Um, and you can improve the muscles that you do have, so you can strengthen what you've got. And that's not, again, your arms and legs, that's your breathing muscles as well. So, for example, if your breathing muscles are a bit stronger, you're able to cope with, say, an exacerbation of your airways disease. That's, that's true. Um, you're able to transport blood around your body better. And that, oxygen, that blood's good at delivering oxygen to your muscles and delivering sort of energy to your muscles as well. And you're better at flushing out waste products as well. Um, so that's pretty good for you. And in terms of flexibility, um, your flexibility will improve with exercise. So those moments where you go to stand up and go, oh, yeah, just as you go to stand up, that might have a thing of the past if you up your exercise a little more. And I alluded to the non-physical effects uh, and the benefits of exercise. Exercise as a treatment for depression is fantastic. People who are depressed, there's really strong evidence that if we get them exercising more regularly, it helps with low mood depression. Um, it boosts people's confidence. I see this all the time. But people are scared of being breathless. So they don't do very much. Once they're educated through that and they start, um, start doing a bit more, they realise they're actually capable of a lot more than they thought that they were. And confidence improves. And that's really good to see. How breathless you feel. You might not be able to do a greater distance in terms of walking, but how you feel at the end of walking that distance might change. 
uh, that's a great thing. Um, your social health, so being able to go and visit your friends or go to a restaurant or uh, walk around the shops. Um, being able to do that, having done some exercise, is a great thing. Sleep, uh, lots of people who don't exercise very much have poor sleep, and your sleep pattern can improve if you exercise a little bit. So any insomniacs here? Well, well, we'll challenge that, I've got another two hours to go. <laughs> okay. Um, I, found, I found this in a little bit of research, and I thought, I thought it was quite interesting. So, in terms of your benefits along your y-axis, and how hard you have to work, is along the bottom. And I've, there are two lines. The red line is all about that fitness that I started, start, kicked off with. But green is health. Mm. And hopefully what that shows you, is you don't need to do very much to start to be a bit healthier. To get fitter, you have to work a bit harder. And then maybe so you have to work at sort of 60, 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. That's that's when it starts sort of going very steep. That red line. Um, but in terms of health, you don't need to make a massive uh, a massive commitment or do anything that's particularly strenuous before you start being healthy. <coughs> um, and I thought that's quite encouraging. Um, so you don't. No one's expecting you to get healthier through exercise by doing jogging. Okay, that's not realistic for everyone. But you can certainly get healthier by just starting a moderate frequency of exercise at an intensity. Now, how do you get fitter? Okay, we talked about fitness, but how do you get fitter? Um, well, the nice thing is, fit is a nice acronym you can remember. So you, you can increase any of these four dimensions and progress your level of exercise. So frequency, so how many times a, a week you're exercising. If you increase that, you're doing more exercise and you might get fitter. Intensity, so how hard you're working when you exercise. So that might be your walking speed, for example. Or it might be the, the weights that you're trying to, to lift. How long each session is, so maybe you start off at 5 minutes and then build it up to 10 minutes and 15 minutes and aiming for that reduce to 30 minutes each session. And you might change the type of exercise. So you might do walking and brisk walking. You might have a go at jogging a few steps, I don't know. Uh, if you're me, it is a few steps, I give up on that. Um, you might do a bit of cycling. Okay, so if you change any of those things, you can change how hard it is for you. Um, so one example of intensity, you might you might be the sort of person who sees dust. I don't, unfortunately, my wife doesn't like it. But if you're dusting a, a room, it might be nice to have an idea of how long it takes you to dust that room. And then the next time you go to dust the room, maybe see if you can do it in a slightly shorter time. You'll have to work a bit harder, yeah? But that's a way of fucking the intensity. I don't know why I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a poll on the Bronco Exorcist website. It just said, you should not do it. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Um, say you start, you start with just tapping your foot in front of him. He doesn't. 
you might start moving your head or the rest of your body, then you might get a bit more vigorous still. Okay, and a bit more vigorous still. <laughs> and a bit more vigorous still. And finally, you might end up doing that. Okay? So, yeah, break dancing, you never know, but you can change the type of exercise. <laughs> I was really pleased to find someone doing the Gertie song. <laughs> so, how do you know if you're doing enough, if you're working hard enough on your exercise? Well, there are four things to bear in mind, I think. Breathlessness is probably the one that pops into most people's heads first. Pain is another one. If it's feeling like a strain, and it's painful, you're probably doing too much. Mm -hmm. I put heart rate in brackets because um, I don't know many people who feel their pulse when they exercise. Some people do. And, um, on the telly, you see people exercising and go, check your heart rate and those kind of things. Most people aren't accustomed to doing that, which is why I put it in brackets. Um, if you're looking at a, a, a maximum heart rate, the guideline is 220 take away your age, but that doesn't apply to everyone. And I said you should be working about 60 to 70 percent of that for that, that steep change in your fitness. Um, but I think for most people, heart rate isn't helpful. Um, but I think uh, the fourth and mo most important really to, for exercise to be helpful in a long term commitment is to have some goals. So you think to yourself, why am I doing this and what am I trying to achieve? Um, there's a scale, and I've photocopied some of these, um, of 0 to 10 that rates breathlessness. And when, as physios, when we're advising people um, how they should be feeling when they exercise, using this scale of 0 to 10, we should say people should be exercising around a three and a four when they exercise. Okay. Um, now, if you want to take a copy of this and use, use it to refer to when you're exercising, you're more than welcome. But generally speaking, you should be slightly out of breath, but you should still be able to hold a conversation and talk to the person in the room with you or next to you. If you can't talk to them, you're working too hard. So you should be breathless, but not speechless. Okay. Um, if you are breathless, there are ways to reduce your breathlessness to the experience when you exercise. One is pursing your lips when you're breathing out. So when you're exercising, you can go... And uh, some physios say, blow as you go. Uh, I don't know if that helps you remember it or not. Um, Pacing yourself, so maybe not going at it hunger and tongs, um, and prioritising, so maybe working on, do I need to do this all in one go, uh, or do I need to do this now, or can I do this later? Because that 30 minutes, if you can't do 30 minutes in, in one fell swoop, it's okay to break it up into smaller chunks, uh, for example 10 minutes, that's acceptable. In fact, I'll be dead chuffed if you did anything really. So, when you're thinking about setting yourself goals around exercise, it's nice to have what we call smart goals. So they should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed. Um, because if I said to myself, right, I want to be able to run a marathon, that doesn't really help me. And it's, a, it's pie in the sky, that goal, because when am I going to run the marathon? And is that something that I'm realistically going to commit to doing? And <coughs> I think when I was a boy, I used to think about running the London Marathon. And I haven't got there yet. Maybe that's something I'll aim for in the future. But for me, it would be a silly goal, because re realistically, I'm not going to, to commit to that. Um, losing four stone in two months, well, <coughs> exercise, unless you do moderately vigorous exercise, won't contribute to weight loss. Um, if, I, if I thought to myself, I never want to be breathless again, and to get there via exercise, I don't think that's realistic. Um, and to be able to do what I could do 15 years ago, 
I don't think that's very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, or time. So some ideas for what might be a smarter goal might be being able to climb stairs without stopping halfway in the next, after two months of doing some exercise. Because currently I might need two rests up the flight of stairs. So that might be something worth aiming towards. Um, I might want to feel that within the month I want to feel less breathless, you know, judging at that 0 to 10 scale. Um, if I get myself dressed in the morning, how breathless that makes me feel. I might feel at Christmas Eve, I might want to walk around my friend's house and have a drink. I might want to taxi back, I don't know. <laughs> but that might be a realistic goal, because it might be a, a distance that you can walk, um, and there's a time frame on it. Or you might have family getting married, and you might want to dance at the reception for more than a minute or two. See, there's something specific there, and there's something measurable, and there's something achievable, it's realistic and it's timed. So those those things might help focus your exercise program that you come up with for yourself. Coming back to age, um, I found this cartoon and I thought it was quite nice to substitute exercise with math. So I wish I could do exercise like when I was young. It doesn't come easy like it once did. Exercise is a game for the young. I need to sit back and let the future happen. You're 13. <laughs> yes, and it's time I accept that. Um, age is quite often the reason that people give me why they can't exercise. Um, in June this year, this lady, I think she was from, Te I think she was from Texas, She's 100 years old and she went to China to compete, playing table tennis. I thought that was quite nice. Um, you can be creative around exercise. And there are lots of things you can do uh, and age isn't necessarily a barrier. Uh, this is the chap I think I was telling you about him. Oh, probably yeah. Was, yeah. Um, oh, that's the crazy. world record holder for marathons. Uh, he's a Greek guy, he's 98 and he was asked about if he's going to keep doing marathons, and he thought, well, if we keep doing it for the next five years, it might not be good for my knees. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, something a bit more current. Yeah. How old's Paul Daniels? 72, yeah, yeah. yes, 72. What about Bruce? He's doing the dancing bit, isn't he? Yeah, I think Bruce was used to doing dancing. Yeah. Paul Daniels never struck me as being light on his feet, uh, but at age of 17 to commit to that amount of training, uh, I think that's, that's it'd be interesting to see how he gets on. <laughs> oh yes, the fabulous Daddy McGee. Okay, uh, so if you're coming up with a a training, training regime, it sounds horrible, a regime, or exercise program. Um, I think for it to be successful, you have to have something that's realistic and achievable. So it'd be stupid for me to tell everyone in this room to go for a, a, a 30 minute walk every day and get out of breath every day, because that's not realistic. It might be achievable, but it's not realistic. Um, you've got to think about what's right for the individual. So you yourself will know roughly where you are now in terms of your exercise abilities. Um, and you have to think, well, how, how might I improve that or might maintain that? And you've got to make sure you can fit it into your, into your day and into your week. Because if you make it so that it, it's, ne it's, it's uh, impossible to fit it into your, your week, you're never going to do it. Um, so don't... Make, make sure whatever you choose to do, you can actually do it and keep doing it. Um, I think this is where most people's gym membership around New Year fall, falls away. They think it's a good idea, but to commit to going to the gym, it's a big time investment. As well as making you feel a bit short of breath and embarrassed about. Um, so, in summary, my top tips for exercise. Um, have goals, 
and think about how you're doing against those goals regularly. Now, some people do an exercise diary, so they write down what they've done in the week and how their goal is <coughs> getting on. Uh, it's important that you monitor how you're getting on, otherwise it will disappear. Um, make it routine, not exceptional. So, I won't decide one day to join Georgie on a, a 10k run. Um, I think I'd cry. <laughs> you can come to my Irish dancing class then. Yeah. <laughs> Dancing's great, actually. It should be fun. Whatever you do, it should, you should enjoy it. If you hate it, there's no way you're going to continue doing it unless you go with someone who's very, very persuasive. Um, and my wife is very persuasive, but she didn't manage to get me to the gym more than twice because I hated it. Um, if you can do it in company, that helps. It helps your commitment to go, and it helps with the enjoyment, I think. It should, it should make you short of breath, but breathless but not speechless, remember. The more creative you can be, um, that's, help, that's helpful. So I had a picture of people with walking frames fencing. Um, it doesn't matter what you do, really. Uh, as long as you're getting a bit more short, uh, a bit breathless and raising your heart rate uh, and not just for two minutes, uh, I think it's good for you. Don't expect to feel better straight away. The benefits of exercise take time to manifest themselves. So I was saying if you don't use it, you lose it. And you, you can lose muscle strength quite quickly. It takes time to build it up. So in a week, you probably won't notice a massive difference, but over a fortnight, three weeks, four weeks, you might well do. So stick at it. If you warm up and warm down, you'll reduce the risk of injury and that ache that you get after exercise. And if you blow as you go, that plastic bleeding, it can help with the breathlessness you feel. And uh, the bottom line is if you don't use what you've got, it will go. So, I think that was it about exercise. Any questions about exercise? Or has everyone follow that again? Okay? Mm -hmm. No one's going to argue with me that I'm wrong. Yeah. Apart from dusting, I've learned one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that swimming. swimming. Swimming was never mentioned there. How does that fit into a regime? Sw swimming, swimming is great all over body exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's if you enjoy swimming, it's great. The thing about swimming that's important to recognise is the weight of the water pushes on your chest. Mm. So you have to work harder in the water a lot of the time. So some people who have heart disease really struggle with swimming. Um, but I, th I think swimming is quite, uh, quite a good all over body exercise. Because the nice thing about swimming is you can, you can take it hard or slow, fast faster or as vigorous or as gentle as you like. There are people who go swimming and they do heads up breaststroke. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They do a length and have a little bit of a chat at the end mm -hmm. and then go the other end. And that's great because that's enjoyable, it's sociable, you're committing to a time frame. Um, some people head down and you know, get out of the way on you know, freestyle or crawling. Swimming, there's, there's a whole range that you can do in swimming. As long as you can talk while you're doing it, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anything else? Have you tried the Chinese exercise, Tai Chi? Tai Chi, yeah. I used to work in mental health, believe it or not. And um, I used to teach a bit of relaxation, and uh, someone was kind enough to show me a bit of Tai Chi. Uh, tai Chi is quite good for relaxation, and it's quite good for strengthening, actually, what we call the core. You might have heard of the core and core stabilities. Um, so an influx from Australia is core stability, and we think that if you're stronger with the, the muscles that sort of hold you up, um, then you're less likely to damage the rest of you. Um, but yes, Tai Chi is quite nice, and it's very relaxing. Have you ever tried it? We did with went on a course, but it is quite complicated. Yeah, I find it quite hard, actually. Yeah, we ended up yeah. uh, packing it in because of just... It's it's quite quite quick, I, went it, so, yeah. I think it depends who you've got. It's the instructor and who's with yeah. you and what level they pitch at. I've never been to a Tai Chi class, 
someone taught me everything I know about Tai Chi in the corridor in five minutes. <laughs> but with that, I was able to stand in front of a group and gently lead people through some gentle yeah. movement. And so I, I think it's like a lot of things. You try them and see if it's for you yeah, or not. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk for, but I do know that you wanted to talk about um, the active cycle of breathing technique. Um, yeah, you can have a drink first if you like. People like to stop for a drink. This bit will only take five or ten minutes.
Normally, I would say between three and five really good deep breaths to start off with when you're trying to clear your chest. The next exercise to try and move stuff out of your chest is to do your long, slow, gentle puffs. And what that will do is it will tend to squeeze mucus from those green areas, mm -hmm. so the small tubes, <coughs> or your small diameter bronchioles, to your medium-sized ones. Okay? So we're not getting it up out of your lungs yet. But by doing long, slow, gentle huffs, that's what happens. And I'm not going to ask everyone to do it, because we'll sound <laughs> quite interesting as a group, but I'll give you a demonstration from the front. Okay. So, to do a long, slow, gentle huff, you take a normal breath in, so not a big breath, a normal breath in, and you go... But I've had to push a bit, okay? If I go right to the end, this is what happens. So please, you don't do this, okay? So this is what shouldn't happen, okay, when you do the slow hunt. Thank you. 
strange that I might think. Um, you wouldn't feel that tickle at those really small areas around the edges. It's important to acknowledge that because you might cough up a lot of stuff quite easily, quite readily, without doing any special huffing or deep breaths. But you might not be addressing all the parts of your lung. Or your lungs. Um, so, people with mucus is a problem and getting rid of it is a problem, and you've got a chest condition where mucus is, is hard to shift for whatever reason. Those deep breaths, slow huffs, fast huffs, and cough, that sequence a few times can make a big difference at how much you shift. And if you're moving it and it's not stagnating in the lungs, you're less likely to pick up infection. And maybe if you've got an infection, it'll help you along with your antibiotics or uh, you know, your other medical treatment, it'll help you get over that a bit quicker, in theory. Now, for some people, <coughs> this, this doesn't work particularly well. But in terms of what's got the best chance of helping you move mucus, this is it. Okay? There are other weird and wonderful things that people can try. Uh, you might have heard of uh, postural drainage. Okay? okay, postural drainage is just using your position to help drain your lungs. It doesn't mean sit up straight and <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, the argument is that if if, I have, if I'm trying to get mucus from the bottom of my chest to here, if I lie on my side, <coughs> then that bit is above that bit, so it will tend to pour downwards. So if I lie there for 15 minutes and then sit up and cough, then that will be cleared what's on your chest. <coughs> Lots of patients tell me it does nothing for them. Um, and if you're coughing up mucus, they, you know, spit it into a pot and you turn the pot upside down and it's still at the bottom of the pot. Um, I could argue that if I turned you upside down and shook you by your ankles, it's still likely to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so postural drainage is something you can try and can work, but this sequence of deep breaths, slow puffs, fast puffs and cough, I think is the best way to go. Technically, active cycle of breathing technique you put deep breaths between the two sorts of puff. I don't think that's necessary and it eats into the time. And certainly when experimenting on my patients, because I like doing that, um, it doesn't seem to make any difference to how much comes up or how easy. Uh, the thing it does make a difference to is time taking. So it'll take less time if you do it my way and it'll be just as effective. No complication supporting, but this is what I find and what patients tell me works for them. Okay? Mm -hmm. I've got a leaflet about perseverance <coughs> that you're welcome to have. Um, but, um, how, that's how often would you recommend people do that a day? Just once or twice? Or I, I think it's flexible to your needs, really. I think and it, it depends on sort of your chest condition. So if you have bronchiectasis, um, I tell people that I see with bronchiectasis, you should treat cleaning your lungs like cleaning your teeth because <coughs> people with bronchiectasis have an underlying reason why their mucus won't move. They have a structural change as well as destruction of the cilia, as well as over uh, exaggerated mucus production. Um, so it's important that that mucus is kept moving. So for people with bronchiectasis, I say do it in the morning and do it in the evening before you get to bed. So cleaning your lungs like cleaning your teeth make it part of your routine. If you're poorly and you've got more speed and more, it's more bothersome, you can do it more often. Um, I'd say that if you wanted to avoid coughing up stuff in front of people, say you're going out for a family meal uh, or you're going to a meeting um, and you don't want to be coughing during that time, you can easily do this on your way there or before you, you do that and or limit the chances of you needing to spontaneously cough. Um, so you can tailor it around your lifestyle. But again, it's that making time. I think it's important to make time to deal with this regularly if you have a problem with moving your mucus out of your life. Um, because even if it doesn't come up and out of your mouth, the fact that you've helped it move along a bit is good at preventing further problems. Um, I've got one last interesting fact for you. Uh, Everyone's lungs make mucus, and it's very difficult to gauge how much, but 
If I told you that my lungs make roughly one litre of new mucus a day, and I don't know if that's surprising to you, and I'm not coughing up loads of mucus all the time. So for me, a litre is going up, turning the corner and being swallowed, continuing the process. So don't be disappointed if you don't get loads <laughs> up. Um, I think what's important is these exercises will help mucus move along a bit. And I think that's important in keeping you healthy. Phil, you know if somebody did cough into the mouth and then they didn't spit out and accidentally swallowed it, there's no harm in that, is there's there? There's no harm at all. That's where my mucus goes to my stomach, mm. where my stomach acid has a good attack on it. So even if there's bugs in it, like it has to be good, it's fine, it's not yeah. a worry. Yeah, if you cough a lot of mucus and swallow it, I've noticed a couple of hours later you can be sick and you're just throwing yeah. up mucus. Because it comes out just the same as it goes down, doesn't it? Yeah, if you do produce the whole thing, you swallow it, it's very, very unpleasant. In terms of taste, it's upset just as well. It's upset just as well. Is it the taste? Well, going back to the music, it could have been, it was the volume, really. It was the volume. In which case, then, yeah. It has to strain it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, some cultures believe that it's important to cough and get rid of stuff. Um, an Indian culture, for that culture. Um, I, for most people, it doesn't do any harm, but in most circumstances, clearly, yeah. I, I would avoid being sick. And, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, footballers do it, don't they? Watch them too. It's because it's they're too tight for sprinklers. <laughs>
Or would it be easier if we said, oh, I've just had some blood tests, can you tell me what were they for, yeah. what do they mean? Yeah. 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 Should we go for it, should we do it? Yeah. 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 Real life yeah. human drama. Damn, I need to have gone away to Rada Girls. <laughs> <laughs> so we're thinking, I don't know, we've got to film it at Brown somewhere as well. Yeah. Or we'll just do it live. <laughs> 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 yeah. It'll be good right on the Could hold that back till Christmas. <laughs> and, then, and then you see, if there's something happened, but the whole purpose of that would be like a virtual clinic. But yeah. you know, you could stop us and say, well, hang on a minute. That's happened to me. I don't understand what that blood test is for. What is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then something about the CT scan. Oh, you know, I had a CT scan and, and that was it. And, oh, you told me about the sputum <coughs> result. Have we got this right? Mm -hmm. This is what you found. And so, would that be, mm -hmm. so, you know, you, you, it's not a case that you, you, you don't interrupt because you can't interrupt. This is for you. It's basically a case of sort of like we would do it as we go so that when you've gone away hopefully you feel more confident that you understand the different tests that you have done and what clinics all about. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to the delays, can we just apologise about the delays of getting into clinic because obviously some weeks it is, it is quite a significant delay and then um, we, we really do not take it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really don't take it lightly. Yeah, I'm going to do a little leaf logic. It came about our last meeting that we remember that meeting. And uh, for new patients to say, to expect to be clinical about three hours and things like that. Because it, it, it is realistically, yeah. you are looking at that sort of length of time, particularly people that travel with so. stuff. Is it possible for somebody to look up about these masks? Yes. I'm supposed yes. to use them in the garden. Yeah, we've got one. Yeah, we've got one. Uh, we yeah. have had any actual oh, information yeah. about when they put the chest up. Yes. Yeah. Chest. Yeah. I got in touch with you know, the 3M people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they gave me a phone number. I can't remember the, the place off the top of my head. But they gave me a stop. He said they were made, uh, they supplied them mainly for, um, you know, um, people for. Protect the safety in the yeah. 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 It's, that's what they provide. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.